tune up in the dressing room where you can tune up with an audience. So much more fun, you know, you're born more to do. It's all the same this year as was last year. We let them play for you now. Something which we played over the other side of the island when we were here last year, wearing the same clothes, carrying the same guitars, with the same personnel and the same road manager, and all the groups using our PA in the same as last year. <laughs> I really didn't like working with that band at all. Was the Isle of Wight fun? No. What we produced was not something that I wanted any part of, particularly. The Who didn't make the kind of music that I wanted to make. They weren't the kind of band I wanted to be in. And it was just one of those things where I just happened to be there. And when you put us together, we went off in this particular direction. And if we'd have been robbing banks, I would have had as little control in whether or not I was a part of it or not. I always felt uncomfortable, I always felt, I always felt ill at ease. And my wife, for example, you know, just, it, it drove her nuts, you know. I would come back from a tour and she'd say, well, what was it like? And I'd say, it was hell. And she'd say, well, why do you do it? And I would say, because I don't have a choice. And she'd say, well, you do have a choice. And I said, well, I don't have a choice. I don't have a choice, you know. I felt trapped. I felt imprisoned. But I also felt that as a band we were performing a function and also as a band in other words that I'd got a commission this was the this was the interesting point that wrote the first song for the who called can't explain which was a hit here and I felt that that had connected with the audience What I felt had happened was is that the band, the members of the band, the record company, the managers, and the audience were all saying to me, we really like this song you wrote, write some more. And I thought, ah, you know, I'm an artist, I've got a commission. And that has sustained me all my life. Okay. Just that simple thing, write some more. It's just such a great thing to be told if you're a writer. <laughs> you know, we want to hear something and read we want to hear something more from you. It's such a, so that sustained me. We'd like to carry on with a, a new number written by Pete. It's a number called I Don't Know Myself. What I had difficulty with was the fact that I knew that what we were going to doing was going to destroy my father. And uh, that was a, oh yeah, yeah definitely. You know. Try once in a while. You know, he when I was twelve or thirteen, he was still going off on the on the bus, you know, to do shows at Norwich City Playhouse and coming back at four in the morning, you know, having played a gig, you know. And by the time we were doing our first bunch of pubs, you know, he was out of work. In the end I had to give up a lot of my own values, my own moral values, and I'm not saying that I drifted into decadence, I'd rather, more like kind of walked open-hearted into the jaws of hell, would be more like it. <laughs> <laughs> what was awful was getting up to the point where I'm going to leave art college and go off with this fucking horrible band of yobos, with, with, with people with whom I had absolutely nothing in common. Whatsoever. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Um, it's hard to take that at face value, but it's probably true. Yeah. Uh, next thing I knew, I'm breaking up guitars at gigs, you know, saying, I am destroying the instrument of my bourgeois childhood longing, you know, which was that I used to stand outside shops and people used to kind of go, what a great act! And I'd say, it's not an act, it's a, you know, I don't even have the guys in the band going, what a lot of pompous, pretentious drivel. And I go, no, it's auto-destructive art. And uh, that's where I still am. I'm still in that place where I feel that art has a function which reflects how we feel and how we act. Keith Moon had a wonderful, we were on our way to an airport one day and we're late for the plane and he said, oh my God, oh my God, I've got to go back to my hotel room. And we thought he'd left drugs in his room or something. We turn around, we know we're going to miss the plane, we might be late for the gig. We rush back to the hotel and he rushes in, comes out with a TV set, throws it into the swimming pool, gets back in the car and goes, I nearly forgot. 
<laughs> it's throwing television sets out of hotel rooms is very, very, very important. Don't you think? Yes, I yeah, agree with you fucking totally. hell. It's very important that somebody does it and does it often and very, very, very often. And the people that do it should be, you know, regarded as being very, very special, I think. We would smash up twice the value of the gig often on the stage. You know, and on the way home, you know, you'd have a concerned wife say to you, know, does this really make sense? And you go, it's art, you know, look at the crowd, you know. Wow! At the Isle of Wight, I felt that you and the audience were one, and there was no other performer like that. Hendrix was mesmerizing, but it wasn't, it wasn't an interactive thing which is what you do so well. And that was the biggest audience you have faced. The Woodstock was pretty big. Well, Woodstock was not as big as the Isle of Wight. Hmm. It was 600,000 at the Isle of Wight and about Jesus. 400 at the... Uh, so what did you feel? Did you feel that during the performance that you were really... You had the audience in the palm of your hand? I had no idea it was that big. No idea at all. It's stunning. How did they get them over there? there By boat. <laughs> so therefore, there was a count because it's an official, it's British Railways that was running all, all the right. boats. That's what the, the figure they came up with. Well, the thing, the thing about it was we tend to just go on and begin. And um, there'd been quite a few distractions a bit prior to the Isle of Wight. Partly was, were, was the distraction for me that a lot of my friends, like our cameraman today, Nick, uh, I, I was close to, and uh, and I was worried about them because I'd heard that there was trouble. And I knew that some of the guys were out the back, and we, we you you lost radio contact with them, I know. They're going to break the wall down. Ask them if they can break it down tonight, and we will call the festival off. Could you ask them that? So when I, when I went on in those circumstances, I just kind of cleared my head and tried to engage. The other thing was is that I, I remember being quite bullshit, trying to challenge the audience to, to focus. Oh, you buggers! Christmas. Because when Joni Mitchell was on, there were quite a few distractions in the audience and she broke down temporarily and I remember thinking, you know, that won't happen to us, kind of thing. <laughs> it was very easy to get people wrong. I think a lot of those people that you're talking about were probably immensely sincere. And the people that are here are going to use this festival as they want and they're going to use the facilities as they want and, you know, if necessary, we're going to enter the festival ground in order to 